existing 350 Board of Education in order October 12, 2015. Welcome to visitors. Any additions or changes to the agenda? Yeah, we need to add one uh, item number three for disposal of district property and business items. Okay. And you have a hard copy of the sheet there. Thank you. Thank you twice. Any other changes or additions? <coughs> Mr. President, I move the board accept the approved agenda as amended. Second. So moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried 6 0. I did send the uh, proper check register. We didn't have checks, so they couldn't be printed at the time I sent the packet. So I sent you this document. It's also on your uh, on your iPad there. So other than that, there's nothing unusual. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the consent agenda for the Second. The move and second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried 6 0. Any patron comments tonight? Okay. Move on to the business agenda. <coughs> Number one, official enrollment report. Um, you have a. Uh, uh, this is updated just a little bit from your. Uh, um, uh, from what I sent you in the packet, um, there's maybe one kid different in the high school, and then the learning center enrollment was off by about three. So it's a few lower than what I sent you. But, uh, this, this, the right side here is our preliminary. This, this column here is the head count, and then this would be the FTE associated with that. Kindergartners, the count is half, uh, unless they're they have an IEP, they're in special ed, then they count as one. Uh, we only count the students with an IEP in uh, preschool. Uh, everybody else, for all intents and purposes, is, counts as one. So that puts our FTE, which is what used to determine our funding, at 331.5. And uh, that was 345 last year. So you can see here's graphical representation of what's what's happened in the history uh, with our uh, with our enrollment um, if you take the entire 10-year history uh, and project out based on that data it's a loss of about two and a half percent each year uh, if you look at the last eight years it's really pretty flat so disregard these two it's really almost flat um, and then if you take the last five years, it's trending upwards. So it's difficult to predict what's going to happen with our enrollment, but those are some things we look at. What's overall history done, and then what's the recent history done? So uh, looking at numbers, projecting out, we're going to kind of follow that pattern a little up and a little down is my best guess for the near future. Um, at some point, they will get back to counting enrollment numbers in some way for our funding. <coughs> So it is important that we still be accurate with that. This shows the demographics of our uh, population. A lot of numbers here. Um, our free lunch count, our free and reduced lunch count. I've got two different totals here for each building. And then the total. So free and reduced lunch count you know, determines, uh, tells us you know, our poverty level. Of about 58% of our students are and there's a certain level of poverty. Uh, special ed students, that's this one, about 23% of our population is identified as special needs. They have an individual education plan, that's what it stands for. ELL is English language learners. Uh, in their family, they speak a, uh, another native language. So the kids may be proficient in English, and they may be doing just fine. We have a lot of those kids, uh, but a lot of them are not. So, 16%. So, just 
because we're final enrollment numbers that we submitted to the state. Does anybody have any questions on any of that? Superintendent evaluation. Um, each year, we uh, the board is required to evaluate superintendent. In the first three years of employment, it's twice per year, uh, and annually after that. So we're in the point where we just do this once a year. Uh, I included the uh, form here for you just to see it, um, and I will send this to you. And. I think in past years we've given maybe a couple of weeks to fill that out. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, two weeks. That would put us at October 26th. So I will send it to you all uh, in a Word document. If you could fill that out on your computer and then email it to Chad, that's the easiest way. Does everyone have my email? I'll include it with that. <coughs> that's all right. Then I'll compile it and we'll go over it at the next meeting. And this is a time where I appreciate the feedback. So. Yeah, it's important to give it some thought and put down handwritten recommendations, not just check. We want you to check the box, but also Josh needs some uh, recommendations. But everyone needs a chance to improve and you want to get that by knowing. What your strengths are and any weaknesses that I see. Okay, so two weeks. All right, item number three disposal of equipment. Uh, you have that extra sheet there. The uh, <laughs> we've done some work in the library here to clean some things out. Uh, we're looking at maybe adding a computer lab over here where we can do our adult uh, <coughs> learning down here on a full-time basis uh, rather than pay ESDAC to do that for us. Um, we pay a lot of money to them to do that. So that's one area we're looking at uh, improving. So part of that is cleaning some of this stuff out. You can see there's a lot of old things that just need to go. Uh, friends of the library and uh, Laura and the library staff have gone through this and this is their recommendation on what needs to go. Uh, board policy says the board needs to approve disposal of all, all property of significant value. Uh, so my recommendation is that uh, the board would approve uh, disposal of this property in a manner that I determined. Some of the things I'm trying to determine are, is it worth giving to the museum uh, or something like that? If there's anything of value, we may try to sell it, but really a lot of it is junk. Mr. President, I move the board approve the list of district property for disposal in a manner determined by the superintendent. Second. Move and seconded to approve the list of district property for disposal in a manner determined by the superintendent. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried 6-0. Communications, board members. Eric, start with you. Nothing this time. Nothing. Thanks. Nothing. Barb. I'm embarrassed to say I missed it. <laughs> the meeting, so my apologies to the foundation. But I have to go into other things. Yeah. I guess you can give the foundation or Julianne report. There. I don't have anything in there. I didn't make the foundation meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure Mr. Meyer will go over it in his report. We talked about the Carl Bilby gift, so I'll, I'll let Mr. Meyer give the details on that. So. All right, um, administrative reports. Mr. Bergen? Sorry, to use mm -hmm. Um Enrollment. Um, you can see it's 
see by grade, it's uh, been pretty, it's started, been pretty steady. Um, uh, seventh, eighth grade, we stayed at 39, 18 in one class, 21 in another. You can see the high school count, or the 7 through 12 counts, 150. And on the, on the right hand side, I put there, there's, um, we have uh, the, in the 10th grade, there's one student at the learning center, uh, one student um, at the learning center, 11th grade, one student at the learning center, and 12th grade, one foreign exchange student, um, and one student that attends Haskins and Pratt. So when you put those together, you have the 150, and then there are um, learning center, there are a total of 22 at the learning center. When you include those three there, plus 19 adults, makes 22. Class leadership last year, if you remember, those who were here, we uh, we began this process where we got together uh, three times a year with Boisington and Ellenwood with a group of students. And there's a gentleman named Joe Coles, and he goes over uh, leadership um, uh, things, uh, qualities, and things with those students um, in a group. And we went to we went to those we hosted it one time, and then we went to Boisington and Ellenwood. This year we're doing that again. It's, we host it first this year in October, and it's on the 22nd. And we'll do it out of the lodge uh, on that day from 9.30 to roughly 2 o'clock. Um, and then in December, we go to Hoisington, and then in February, I believe, we, the students will go to Ellenwood. So I want to mention that. Um, ACT prep, we've been working on ways to uh, prepare kids to take the ACT. So we've uh, working, looking at some software, looking at ways we can do that, or how often we can do that during the course of a week to prepare kids as they get closer to taking ACT. Uh, on September 30th, Mrs. Hacker took our seniors to the Pratt College Fair. We went to that last year, and uh, she thought it was uh, worth going again. It doesn't really last real long. We were there a couple hours, um, and seniors got to see uh, different things relative to post-secondary education. Um, Bill Cordes, the last couple of years, we've had him here over the uh, numerous years, but over the last couple of years he's been here on several occasions to talk to our kids. Uh, about his program, school unity, leadership, um, social media, he talks about anything. And so we're trying to work out a way that he can come back and talk to our kids again. So I just want to mention that. Uh, you probably already know uh, tomorrow is uh, school pictures. I'm sure that'll be mentioned, but you can all come back and get your picture like you did when you were in school. I'm sure you're excited about that. That's <laughs> weird. Be the first one you can get there. Um, Postseason for the athletics, our tennis was at South Barber. The, girl, the girls uh, went to the regional, didn't, didn't qualify for state. Volleyball will be on the 24th at Greensburg. Our cross country goes to me. So we'll see how they uh, fare on that. I'm sure the others will mention about the parent teacher conference on the 26th. Um, well, I, gonna, I didn't put that on there, but you guys remember last year, we, the last couple of years we started this, the SAFE team. Seat belts are for everyone. That's what SAFE means through our FCCLA. And we, um, we had an organization and we were in Stafford County and we went with Maxville and Stafford to see who could, who could get the most where people could start wearing seat belts. And the kids, uh, FCCLA took that. Last year, Morgan Crankenberg wrote a letter and it got sent to Topeka and then she went up there to talk to uh, the legislature about it. And they made this uh, traffic safety Mag brochure and they put a picture of our kids right there in the middle of it's kind of cool. So that's kind of thought. Some of you remember that we're on the board last year about the safe. So we'll start that up again. I'm sure for show always been in, so uh, that's kind of cool. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, the football scheduling meeting. I mentioned last month we um, every two years you make a football schedule. And we, uh, <coughs> the last 10, 12, 15 years, I'm not sure how long you, you, meet, you meet in Salina and you work out a schedule. You, you're, you're given your district assignments. Um, and some, you might, in 11 man schools, most of them are in 14 districts. But 18, eight, man, uh, eight man teams are given usually five team districts or six or seven. So if you have a 17, if you have a 16 district, for example, like we do, in a 16 district, you'd be given. To, uh, the schedule would be made, you'd have those six schools, and on week five, six, seven, eight, nine, you'd play those schools in the order they have in the football manual. Then you have to find a schedule for weeks one through four. 
and hopefully you can do that within your lead schools who aren't in your district, if I didn't confuse anybody there. So if they're, not, if they're in your district, they're assigned, that's who you played, and it tells you who you played week five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so um, uh, we've never, we, or I don't remember, recall the last time when we get our district assignment, you don't get your district assignment until you get there, until all there, and then they hand them out. And so then people are trying to make a schedule, and some people, if you're in, if you're in a 17 district or you have a hole in your schedule, you have to try to fill that, but somebody has to be open the week you are. So uh, in our case, it's worked out where we got 16 districts, so we had five games, and then we could fill the, other, the first four games with other schools in our league. So um, it worked out. We have never gone. Um, our district is Ellenwood, Canton, Galva, Gossel, Central Plains, and Little River. So it's been a long time. I'm not sure we ever went north and east. So usually we are, and Maxwell's not in our district, which is somewhat odd, but that's just the way our, in our, in our um, district <coughs> with the schools. So weeks five through nine, we play those schools, and then we'll play Maxville, Ness City, Kinsley, and Otis Bison, and the other games. So, and football's the only one that goes every two years, so we'll have this schedule that we have next fall, and then it'll be the exact opposite the following year. Just like this year is the second year of a two-year cycle. And uh, so I'm hoping we um, had some numerous people ask me if we were gonna have a football team next year. Um, they asked me that league meeting. They asked me that at that meeting too. And so I told them we were, and we're gonna make a schedule. So hopefully everything will we'll get more kids out. Be good. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that we did get a schedule. Everything said we don't have any openings in our schedule. Like some people, when they left there, not everybody had a full schedule. If you had a week two open and you couldn't find anybody to play week two, you know you might be able to look out of state, but you know if you don't want to drive. I mean, it depends on how far you want to drive. So, anyway, we're set. I don't think anybody has any questions about that or about how that works. So. Glad you're here. Yeah. Any questions, That's it. Mr. Burke? Questions. Thank you. You bet. Mr. Rowley. Um, Mr. Meyer already showed you our enrollment numbers. Uh, 167 <coughs> is our K6 enrollment count, and then we have another. Uh, 38 in our preschool building. Two of those are Maxwell <laughs> students. Um, fire safety was last week. If you heard the sirens going off in the afternoon on Thursday and Friday, it's because they were taking our kids around town, riding the fire trucks and ambulances and stuff. Did a little different this year. Um, in the past, they've always kind of come to the classrooms and done some stuff in the classroom. They still did that with kindergarten and preschool, but our first through fourth graders, they took up to the actual fire station and they had like a smoke simulator thing where they had to practice staying low and I, I wasn't out there for it but they said it was supposed to simulate a reel as if there were a fire and you know you couldn't see when you were up high and had to stay down low and kind of crawl out of a crawl out of a room or whatever so they seemed to like that um the the fire or the emt uh, stafford county was able to provide every kid with a bag that had a uh, some a few kind of knickknacks in it plus a smoke alarm so every kid k through four got a smoke alarm to take home and put in their house um miss kansas will be visiting us tomorrow in the afternoon she's going to do a short little presentation for kindergarten through second grade um, one through third through sixth grade and then she's also going to uh, just briefly appear in our preschool classroom so something something new that hopefully the kids will enjoy um, site council last week we had our um, first site council meeting of the year um, Mr. Meyer gave an update on a lot of stuff. He may talk about that in his report. Um, when we split up and did some building level things, um, I kind of talked about the um, standards-based grade card that I brought up last meeting and that I showed you some stuff in here. They seem to be very receptive to it as well. We talked about, you know, kind of what what grades mean and, you know, why, why do we give those and, you know, would it, would it make more sense to provide specific feedback as opposed to just a single letter and, and those type of things. So. They seem very um, receptive to, to go in that route. Um, seems like we just started school not too long ago, but Friday's already the end of our first nine weeks. So um, next Monday we have a in-service and work day. Um, half the day will be spent in in-service. The other half will be teachers working at completing their grade cards to get out of parent-teacher conferences. Um, the in-service portion, we're going to be doing something district-wide. We're going to be watching a movie called Most Likely to Succeed and have some um, kind of discussions on that, which kind of talks about 
um, the future of education, and are you going to touch that in your board report? Uh, go ahead. Okay, I don't know a lot about it, um, other than it kind of <clears throat> talks about how um, just kind of the, the different direction that education is going, whereas opposed to just you know regurgitating knowledge to the students, now we're now they're expected to to do something with that, and kind of how how that's changing, and, and what what schools are are starting to look like, or or may look like in the future, and so on, and, and what that maybe means for us. Um, two weeks from today, uh, parent-teacher conferences from three to nine o'clock. Um, you know, good chance to get the parents in the building and meet with the teachers and talk about how their child's doing and maybe you know what they can be doing outside of school and stuff to to improve their performance in the classroom. So always good to get parents here. And then um, the next board meeting, November 9th, um, Myself and Mr. Bergen will actually be gone. We'll be at the KAESP and KSSP Fall Conference in Wichita, so um, doing some of our professional development on those two days. So that's all that I have. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Murray. Uh, a couple of things I didn't have on here. Uh, I did put a note in one of the Friday notes about that, uh, that film. Uh, on the 19th, next Monday, a week from today, we'll start that about 8.45. If you can get loose, you'd like to come watch that. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to have you invited to site council as well. So uh, <coughs> we hash what Mr. Oliver said there. But uh, Another thing I didn't have on my report, but uh, 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 Chad brought it up, the uh, Dudry money that was donated uh, really looking at three different ways to use that money and I need to sit down with the family and see what they want to do, what uh, Mr. Dudry would like to do. Uh, we've, we've talked about these things. One would be a, what we call a post-graduation scholarship. Uh, you know, maybe an incentive to entice people to come back here and work. Maybe I say come back, maybe just to recruit people here. Uh, we would. Uh, pay off some student loans uh, to help recruit a teacher. Uh, maybe with something tied to that that you have to stay for five years or something like that. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, with the, that in mind about a teacher shortage uh, and being tough to recruit teachers, uh, would be to encourage St. John High graduates to enter the education profession. Uh, so maybe offering a scholarship to our graduates that want to become teachers. Um, and then uh, third, uh, I believe we talked about it at this board, that uh, we have kids taking college classes for dual credit you know, during their high school career, but some of them may not be able to afford it, uh, so offering scholarships to kids so they can take those courses right now in high school. So uh, a few different ways where we can use those funds. So, our state assessment results, uh, we've talked for a few years now how we don't want to focus on the test. I don't want, we don't want teachers cramming for these tests. Uh, we want them learning the curriculum, when students learn and not prepping for tests. Uh, <clears throat> this is kind of an interim test, but it is interesting to see uh, we're not focusing on the test, but how have we done? So there's, you have results here if you click on the blue box on the top left. It's under my documents, is assessment results. And the Adobe Reader. Um, Scroll swipe that way to your left. On top, top left there. Assessment results. You can do books. There you go. So that's maybe be a little easier to see there, but uh, <coughs> what these what these boxes mean is that this our little spider this box and whisker plot shows where our kids fall. The two seventy five is the median. Uh, score of our kids. How they, what does the 275 mean? Doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Uh, we compare that to the what the state median was. So you can see, and again, this first one is 
English language arts. Uh, so you kind of see some are higher and some are lower. And uh, again, we're not going to put a lot of emphasis on this because, again, we've been saying we don't want to prep for this test. Uh, we'll get whatever information we can get out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. The second page, we're still in English language arts. Uh, level two, three, and four would mean a grade level. Level three and four would be career and college ready. So that's, uh, again, the top one would be for district and the bottom one be, would be for the state. So, uh, for example, our seventh grade there, you know, five percent of our kids were in the category four. 38% in three, and so on. You can compare that to the state. And then math results, um, much the same laid out. Uh, so comparing it to the state. So what information can we get from that? Uh, I don't really know right now. And this is still an interim assessment. This isn't the final assessment. Uh, they're still working out some of the details of what the final assessment will be. So we'll get whatever information we can out of that and move on with life. So any quick questions about that? There's this one, <clears throat> the last of the math, has like a greater than or less than sign equals percentage. Why is that one different than all the rest? Um, I don't know. Um, it's got an asterisk. The number of kids that tested. The exact number yeah. of them sealed to protect student privacy. I think because there's a very limited number of students in that class, mm. so they don't include the percentage, they just give you a range. It's less than or equal to 10%, and where the other classes have more kids. So. Is there a reason we don't have a ninth grade? Uh, they don't test in ninth grade. In high school, they just test once. Okay. And that's in 10th grade. Yeah. So it seems like they skipped a grade, but not really. It's okay. grades 3 through 8, and then once in high school. And in Kansas, it's 10th grade. Okay. Uh, our site council meeting, we went over um, a lot of things. Uh, had some great discussions. Um, one of the things we talked about was the Communities That Care survey. Um, I'm not sure how much you've been able to look at that. I sent that to you in an email. It's on your documents there. It's the CTC 2015. The first page looks like this. I'll have it up here. But find it easy to look on here. Um, these numbers here on the first page just shows our the, not the percentage of kids that completed the survey in each grade in our district and then in the county. Um, it kind of looks like we're the only district that participated, but some of the numbers are off from Stafford County compared to our district. So there may have just been a few kids in the other districts that took it. So. Uh, the protective data um, things like are, are obvious community rewards, rewards for positive behavior. Um, we can look at these and say, you know, our data is higher than that of the state. That's a positive. Um, we didn't ask the family questions. We have to send out forms to parents for that. And we thought it was more important to get everybody involved in the survey than to get those questions asked. So I'm not going to go through every one of these questions, but um, and then risk data, uh, we would like to see less than state average, you know, comparing. So a lot of these things are at or a little above. In some cases, a lot above, some below. Things like perceived availability of drugs. So a bit higher concerns, than the state. a lot mm -hmm. of concerns here. And uh, the data compares, why did they compare it to the 2014 state data? Why didn't they compare it to 2015? 
Um, that's because the participation in the state, school districts in the state doing this survey was way down. Um, and then substance abuse data, we can compare um, last year to this year. Some of these things seem to be increasing. Percentage of students who reported smoking marijuana one or more times in the past 30 days. Uh, our blue line there has increased in the past year. Now, sometimes you wonder how many, how honest are kids when they take these surveys? I have no idea. Uh, you wonder if there's that couple of kids that just answer, uh, you know, I do drugs every day just to be a smart aleck. But there's really no way to know that and how many are lying that they don't do have any of those risky behaviors. Uh, so we take the data for uh, uh, bullying data. It seems to have gone up. Seems like the better job we do with communicating about bullying, the, the worse the perception is. The more we talk about it, the more it happens, it seems like, because kids report it. Um, uh, page uh, 10 of that document starts. Uh, additional district information by grade looks like this. The fourth question there. If you wanted to get some alcohol, how easy would it be for you to get some? That shows the percentages of kids that think it would be very easy to get alcohol. Our kids report about 23% about of them think it's very easy to get their hands on. And it shows the difference by grade level. Um, I'm going to skip past cigarettes and go to page 12. Same question for marijuana. If you wanted to get some marijuana, how easy would it be? 37% of the kids say it would be very easy to get their hands on some. 23 for alcohol and 37 for marijuana. Last year it wasn't that way, it's flipped. Kids, and this isn't talking about at school, this is anywhere. Um, this isn't just questions about what's happening at school. So that's very concerning to me. I'm not sure what the cause is or, again, how accurate this data is, but we have to assume that it's um, somewhat accurate. And the uh, question is, what do we, what does this data tell us? What do these things tell us, and what do we do about it? What is there to do about it? Sad part is it still comes to the burning. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can we give a can we give a copy of that to our police department? Huh? I I met with. Uh, Chief, Chief Singh was actually on their site council, and uh, he couldn't make it to the meeting the other day, but he and I met about it uh, just the other day. Well, and especially that. He's got a copy of it. Mm -hmm. they would be, they'd be caught by the police. Mm -hmm. I don't think the kids are even worried about any law enforcement, mm -hmm. which is sad. Uh, what does the chief think needs to happen? Um, I, don't, I can't speak for him, but uh, I think we need to do something. We need to work together and try to address the problem. Um, so you need more access to the school? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I didn't ask him that question specifically, but um, I know he expressed a frustration with uh, uh, people being willing to speak up and say what's going on. I don't think it's necessarily 
in the school as much as it is after hours, extracurricular activities and things like that. They need more presence of law enforcement parties. I talked to Kirk Ives the other day, and he's, I don't even know where he's at. Do you know Clearwater, somewhere down there? I don't know. That's Auburn, a, huh? Is that where it is? And they've got a program within the school, the police, and it's, they go and do drug, random drug testing, and it's, waivers are signed both by the student and the parents, and mm -hmm. he said, one time you get to have a reprieve, and then after that you're, out of the school system, he said, we've cut back on a lot of our issues. Drug testing was brought up, and uh, uh, more, more than once. We spent a significant amount of time discussing it mm -hmm. in our meeting the other day. Now, um, kids have a right to an education. We can't require that kids are drug tested, and if they don't pass, we kick them out of school. That's not... Uh, that's not allowed. But what we can do is if, uh, if students are doing something illegal, doing drugs, and it's caught in a random drug test, they can't participate in activities. Um, what do you mean that's not allowed? I thought, well, it we can't. I thought it was a privilege to come to school, in a way. No. Have to educate them until they're 21 if they're IEP. <clears throat> There's specific reasons that you can exclude kids from uh, from an education that's spelled out in But you in can state law. give them uh, out of school suspension. If there if a kid is smoking marijuana, let's say, on a Saturday night, uh, the school has no recourse to keep that kid out of school. But I mean if they if they test positive twice in a row, you can't give them out of school suspension if they've signed an affidavit or a waiver or whatever that I can be drug tested. No. They, the kids cannot sign away their constitutional right to an education. Not the education, but to the drug. And if I'm caught for the second time, then I have out of school. No. Uh, you made it sound like that that's the program they're doing down there. No. Now, if they're doing it at school, then, then they'll be gone for a year. Uh, that's different, but their behavior off campus, unless it has a connection to school, or it's a felony, uh, that's very clear in the state law that we can't exclude a kid from education unless it has a connection to the school, or it could be a felony that's not connected to the school. Uh, but that's, that's very clear in law. I'd be glad to, to get you uh, have I can have our attorney write something up about that. Yeah, it's not trust you. So if they do a drug test in school, how do they prove that that was done within school hours or outside of school hours? They for don't. What, for what you just said. They can't. I, I don't know that there is a way. But a lot of schools are doing random drug testing now. And the way that, the, the punishment would be, uh, you know, the way kids are in the testing pool, is they participate in activities. Uh, some districts, if they park on campus, some districts, if they attend an extracurricular activity, uh, then they're in the testing pool. Uh, some districts do put everybody in the testing pool. All students are in the testing pool. If your name gets drawn and you're on the football team, if you don't submit to the test, uh, then you're suspended just like you were is if you had a positive test. And what those punishments are, I mean, that would have to be determined. Um, Any idea what the if, cost would be to implement a program like that? Uh, no. Right now we, uh, we have uh, our bus drivers are in the testing pool. We have 10 of them. We pay $5.50, $5.50 a month. So 55 bucks a month for 10 to be in the pool. Now, I don't, if we had, you know, 100 kids in the testing pool, I don't think it would go that way. I've seen some that it's $50 a test. So, you know, if you would test two a month, it would be, you know, $100 a month. But, um, so really, the punishment is exclusion from extracurricular activities. Um, 
or attending extracurricular, coming to a football game. Right. If a student is it is, is not in anything, what and they say, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take that test, you know, really all, only recourse is to call the parents and say, you know, your kid's name is drawn. Um, refuse the test. You can't participate in athletics anymore. Mm -hmm. Or banned FCCLA or whatever it is. So it's not a matter of excluding them from school unless it has something to do with school. And people would say, well, that's not fair. You just, you're just targeting the kids that participate. It's really about the only recourse we have. But uh, the site council, um, the district leadership team, both site councils, yeah. overwhelming support for pursuing random drug testing for our kids. Um, well, obviously well, not working with what we're doing right now. How many of the other districts in the county have it? I don't think so. I didn't ask them, uh, but I don't think so. No, you think. <coughs> You talked about the bus drivers and everything. Or they, the people talked about including all staff, anybody that works at the school, along with the students too. Um, no. Was that we, ever brought up? Uh, no. You mean doing that randomly? No. No, it was focused on kids. One of the things that was brought up was just the perception. Once we do that, uh, what are people going to say? You know, St. John's got a drug problem. And it wasn't brought up that, hey, I don't think we should do this because of that. It was you know, some of the things we have to consider in all this. But. I'd say it's better than the alternative. Right. Yeah, I don't think that would be a problem. People would say, "Say you're doing something about it." Mm -hmm. Proactive, mm -hmm. right? This uh, <clears throat> thing is very appropriate here. Uh, you know, to do nothing so, is a decision. So, what, what, you, what would you like to see? Um, I think we need to pursue the random drug testing. I think it's. Uh, Can we get a proposal from a company that we can look at and mm -hmm. go from there? Yep. Um, yeah. I know there's a couple around if we use one of the mill, I'm sure there's mm -hmm. some others close by. Yeah. yeah. What's involved with the test? Is it urine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there can be an appeal. You know, if it's a positive test, you can send off a second half of the sample for, to a different lab. Or a second half or a second sample. We've mm -hmm. had, if you drink too much water and it's watered down, then that will false positive or stuff like that. So, what would be to educate the parents first, you know, or right. in the implementing this? And right. I assume that the parent would be called even if, either way, mm -hmm. that their child was tested. Mm -hmm. Right. Would we have much pushback if we included the staff in that? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we would or not. Right. Yeah. You know, I guess the, the ultimate mm -hmm. goal with a policy like that would be we want it to stop. We don't want to catch kids doing it. We want them to mm -hmm. not. Well, like you said, just doing it would be a deterrent. Yeah. Just having that capability. Mm -hmm. Right. Hopefully. It was also brought up about open Some lunch. Some kids don't carry one. Uh, about, you know, we let kids go. What things happen in that 35 minutes that they're gone that uh, they bring back? Um, so it 
wasn't uh, it was discussed. It was not agreement on whether we should do something different there. Uh, Mr. Berg and I talked a little bit today that there's some schools that have uh, uh, open launch if you meet certain criteria. You know, if you're passing your classes, if you're not in trouble and those things, then you get to leave for it. <laughs> Maybe uh, leaving for lunch would be a privilege that would be subject to random drug tests. Something like that. If you want to leave for lunch, then you're part of the testing pool. So, there's some things to do, but um, it sounds like. Uh, We don't want to at least uh, get more information on this and oh, yeah. head in that mm -hmm. direction. Okay. Um, it, it will take a lot of education and uh, discussions with folks in shoring up our policy. Right now, if it, our uh, code of conduct um, is uh, very similar to a lot of districts, and uh, we talked about maybe trying to come up with some better wording last year. We just, it was too late. We didn't get to it. But, you know, if a kid is caught at a party with a cigarette, it's the same as if he's got a pocket full of cocaine. You know, the first, the first step. And are those equal things? Probably not. Uh, but part of this would be revisiting that code of conduct and what are the punishments? What do we... Uh, what should the consequences be for that behavior? Okay. Anyway. Um, on the report, there is uh, <laughs> another thing I didn't have on there is the survey that was sent to you from the Legislative Research Department. Um, they're considering legislation. They talked about it last year that if your uh, spouse, sibling, um, uh, or parent works for a school district, um, you could not serve on the school board. Uh, if your child works for the school district, it doesn't, it doesn't matter unless that child lives with you. Um, but if, uh, if your brother lives in Topeka and works for, and teaches at Topeka High, you can't serve on the St. John School Board. Uh, why? Uh, I don't know. We should probably pursue that sort of conflict with cities and counties and state legislature as well. But uh, uh, we're not doing that because we're targeting school boards and schools. Uh, so, um, uh, if you'd like to talk to Mitch Holmes about it, I'd be glad to give you his number to talk to him about it. Um, this week, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to attend the State Board of Education meeting. Uh, superintendents were asked to go to those and cover them for our, our region. Um, I have been invited to go up to K-State to talk to their potential math teachers. Uh, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Uh, and also in Manhattan, I have a council of superintendents meeting. So I was lucky to kind of combine all this in one trip and not have to make multiple trips. So uh, I'll be visiting with uh, those KSU students tomorrow, and then Wednesday have council superintendents meeting in Manhattan. Um, you may recall uh, Stan Harris, the Memorial Fund, Lisa's, uh, Lisa Cornell's father, um, when he passed the memorial uh, was to pay for new classroom doors in our elementary school. Uh, that memorial didn't quite pay for it, so the family uh, will pay the difference. Uh, that's going to happen here at the end of this month. They're going to give you new classroom doors. Um, I'm also looking at a bus replacement grant. Uh, will give us up to up to $20,000 for a large bus um, to take it out of service um, uh, to get a more uh, you know, a clean diesel engine uh, bus on the road. So this is through, uh, I believe it's through the EPA uh, to get the dirty buses off. Um, I'll, I'll take the money. <laughs> All politics aside, uh, <laughs> uh, 
so we'll see what happens there. But uh, if uh, we planned on replacing the Suburban this year, we may switch that and try for the bus if we can get a, get uh, half of it paid for or almost half of it paid for. That would be helpful. So uh, that's all I had on my report. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Mm -hmm. Executive session items tonight. Yeah, we include myself and uh, um, Mr. Ollie and Mr. Bergen uh, for uh, 15 minutes. Okay. And there will be no action after this. Okay. Make any motion? Mr. President, I'm going to let the board go into executive session to discuss personnel matters in order to check the privacy of non elected personnel with Mr. Ollie, Mr. Bergen, and Mr. Meyer to be included, and that they return to open session in 15 minutes. Is that right? 15? Mm -hmm. Thank Second. you. Let's move and second it. The board go into executive session to discuss personnel matters in order to check the privacy of non elected personnel with Mr. Ollie, Mr. Bergen, and Mr. Meyer to be included. And then we return to open session in 15 minutes. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 Motion carried 6-0.